uh, let's start. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm sure other people will, will join uh, momentarily, but uh, I'd like to start this uh, presentation on machine learning model validation slash monitoring. Uh, I'll try to cover uh, both. Uh, for sure, in 30 minutes, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of materials, so I'll try to do my best. Who am I? My name is Olivier Blais. Uh, I am a co-founder and a lead of uh, data science for Move AI. Uh, Move AI is a uh, data science uh, consulting company uh, based in Quebec, uh, in Montreal, Quebec. Um, I'm also on the uh, uh, standard console uh, uh, board for the SC42, uh, the ISO standards for uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and I'm working on the uh, validation and verification uh, side of, of that. So um, whatever I'm presenting should have like a, a flavor in 2023 when, when this is going to be uh, released. Uh, we'll see some of those topics uh, back in the ISO norms. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, the goal of the presentation will be to communicate about uh, some foundations, but um, it's going to be uh, looking at every talks and the type of people who are attending. It's going to be a little bit more advanced. Uh, so I, I'll skip a lot of subjects that are very basics, like something like the you no know, train, val, test, uh, data sets, uh, all of that. Uh, basic stuff, uh, I'll skip it, but uh, I can, uh, if you have any question, feel free to ask. Uh, we, I can come back in just 30 minutes, it's so short. Um, and I wanted to have time to present some uh, useful techniques, uh, advanced techniques uh, that are uh, not talked or uh, uh, that are um, less popular but uh, that my team and I uh, are finding very, very useful. We've seen a lot of uh, upside from those techniques. So for first here, uh, why is it important to, uh, to validate a model? Um, when, you're like a, when you're a data scientist, uh, sometimes you, you'll do uh, some models that seems uh, very awesome, but at the end of the day, sometimes it's just that you're overexcited um, you're using some data that you know is pretty biased and not representative of the reality um, and you end up having a model that that's really far from the truth and from the benefit that you're looking for and this is why uh, validation is important um, so uh, model validation at the end is really to gain confidence uh, the goal with validation, and I'm not going to talk about a validation for uh, for a data scientist, a set of tools that the data scientists need to use to select the right uh, model. I'm not going to talk about uh, finding hyperparameters. Here, it's more about the, like the project validation, the the model validation in order to put it to, to put it in production. Uh, this is the goal. It's MLOps at the end of the day. Um, so at that stage, it's really it, it's when you have uh, a valid model, or when the data science team they, uh, believe the model is uh, good enough to be put in production. The goal with model validation would be to gain confidence. So you gain confidence because there was a a validation after the work was done, and it's great when it's uh, independent validation. It's even better. Um, the data science team will love to have validation because it creates a robust process. So before it's in production, here's the list, the to-do list, and there is a validation there just to confirm that everything's working work, uh, well. Um, the stakeholders will like it, especially if your validation can be a type of PDF uh, with uh, simple words. So you can provide this validation uh, it's probably another type of validation, uh, but uh, having this validation in hand is uh, calming and will drive uh, adoption. And finally, so society, and this is why I'm working with the ISO norms, uh, the ISO standards, uh, it's to make sure that uh, this type of process is implemented for e in every uh, industries for uh, strategic uh, models. So you, you, you make sure that the world is a better place because there's no, like, 
cowboy model that uh, is not really validated uh, and have a critical uh, critical decision uh, impact. So we we, we uh, make sure that it's at least well uh, it it's well functioning. So here, uh, when we talk about the validation process, I'll just go quick and um, just to give the additional context. Uh, what you want to do at the validation level, and you'll understand here, I, I just say validation. Uh, I'll just be clear. Uh, you have an initial validation. So a, it's, it's kind of a gate, the permission to deploy. And then you will also have uh, frequent uh, validation in, in a monitoring mode. So uh, is the model still uh, uh, still appropriate? Do you need to retrain? Um, and you'll even have a third type, which is uh, when you have retrained, uh, the goal would be to have an initial validation every time you retrain. So should I put it back in production? especially when you retrain it, uh, it can get very ugly. Uh, uh, by the way, I didn't say it, but uh, feel free to ask any question in the chat box. Uh, I'll try my best to uh, answer at the end of the presentation, but otherwise I'll uh, try to answer them uh, offline. So I'll send uh, back messages. So uh, when we, uh, we want to validate something, uh, we'll try to be as streamlined as possible. So there's no discussion, there's no uh, presentation. It's, okay, here's a data set of new data that has not been used and a model. So the best model that, 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 that you want to validate. You are, then have model validation techniques, plenty of them. It's not just one uh, and it will review some techniques, but it, it, when you start thinking about what's a, a, a performance uh, model, uh, it can get very complex uh, quickly because there are several different dimensions that you want to validate. So when you ask your question, is my model performant? It's either yes or no. Um, when it's not performant, it's important to keep track of that because you don't want to repeat the same mistakes over and uh, have the root cause analysis. Um, you you want to, keep trace because uh, you can learn from it and you can uh, fix, re retest and get it. Uh, here it's, like I said, it's the last, it's a gate. So you don't want to test it over and over for uh, four hours. You want to you wanna test it uh, maybe tw uh, once or twice uh, because you're sure that those are winning candidates that will be put in product soon. If it's performant, you also want to keep track of that using documentation. Uh, it can be for legal purpose, can be for internal purpose, but it's always great to keep track because uh, if ever there's a problem, you can say, you know what, I validated that and it seemed great. So you can go back. Or uh, also it, when you have some, uh, some warnings, you know what, maybe this could be improved, but because it's an MVP, let's push it and then let's fix it later. Uh, so you, you keep trace of that. And then you want to create a mechanism to deploy uh, the model uh, uh, autom uh, automatically at some point. Uh, so here you want it to be as streamlined as possible. Uh, but but the real question here is, uh, so, so what are the different techniques uh, that you need to have to even be able to claim that your model is performant. Um, so there's, there are a lot of different uh, elements that we can think of. Uh, my team and I, uh, we've reviewed a lot of documentation and um, we've uh, established that uh, there are uh, some uh, dimensions that are uh, maybe a little bit more important than others. So um, when we try to to deconstruct what's a performance model. Uh, here are the different, uh, the different elements that uh, came back. So you want it to be predictive. So yeah, for sure it's a predictive model, uh, but uh, you want to avoid a leakage for instance. Um, you want it to be fair. So you want to review the different type of biases. 
uh, that uh, happen. And you want your model to be precise. So to be actually a good model uh, because it could be predictive and fair, but a crappy model, it's uh, totally possible. So you want to avoid that. Uh, but, but the precision, that's where it's, pro it's problematic. Yeah. Anybody will say, you know what, my, my loss on, or my accuracy on uh, tests is 99%, so this is a good model. While, uh, no, it's not necessarily good. Um, so, so you need more depth, and this is where uh, here we spend a lot of time uh, finding those uh, those tools that we'll review. So stability, uh, especially around the data uh, structure, because your model has been built to be used for a certain data structure. So you want the data to stay stable, or at least you want to review if your data is stable. You want your model to be robust. So for sure, uh, you will have different data points. The goal is not to try to replicate every possible data point you might get. Um, so a model is able to infer uh, new data points. But uh, here, the, the goal is to make sure that your model is robust enough to always make a good prediction. And uh, when it's uh, overfitting, uh, it's because it, it's too sensitive. As soon as the the, the, the data change uh, changes slightly, uh, it then it breaks. So you don't want it to break. You so you want it to be robust. And finally, you want it to be certain. So the certainty aspect of it uh, is important. Um, so if you're looking for um, if you're looking at the at accuracy for uh, for a classification, uh, and you have a class one and a class zero. Um, you sometimes it can be invisible to you, but when you start looking at the loss, the goal is to be as certain, so as close as possible from zero and from 100% accuracy, um, uh, 100% uh, like probability. And so you, uh, you're, you're sure about what you're claiming. Uh, this is uh, quite important. And this is uh, those, we will focus on those techniques uh, today. Uh, so let's look at data stability. Uh, so uh, data stability is uh, is a way to uh, measure the structure. So the, the, the way the new data uh, resemble to the uh, baseline data. So uh, here, uh, baseline data, it's simply your trained data set. Okay, it's your baseline. Um, so here, this is an example for one variable, uh, scorecard, scorecard. Um, and this is the, 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 the number. So when you have the scorecard, um, the goal will be to try to look at the distribution of uh, your variable, variable in train. And then your new data set, so it could be uh, in it could be like a, just a new like a production data and uh, your goal will be to make sure that the distributions are similar uh, because if they're they're not similar it's not the the, the variable is not stable and might uh, le lead to risky assumptions so one technique we uh, we can use and this is the i think one of the simplest and uh, more very very efficient method it's called population stability index so the way it works it's very simple like i said you take any variables you have and you create a uh, histogram so you you create bins you split your your data in 10 bins the, the standard is 10 bins and then you 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 just compare the same bins for your baseline data and your new data like I said, like, uh, like uh, we can see here, uh, we see that the distribution has, uh, has uh, shifted slightly to the right. Um, and this, uh, this can cause problem because uh, you're not necessarily used to uh, have those trends. So it might 
uh, predict some, uh, it, it, it might indicate some problems uh, that you wanna, you, you wanna avoid. Uh, and here, how it works is that just like heuristic. Uh, it's es essentially, it's a statistical test for every bins. So the goal will be to have a, a minimal delta between uh, the actual and the expected, like we can see on the table uh, left. So let's take the first row. Uh, the actual is 5%. The expected was 8%. So there's a delta of 3. Then you do a calculation uh, very similar to a chi-square. Then it gives you an index. And you just do a sum of every index, and it gives you the PSI. So the PSI, uh, the PSI has a, a very simple rule of thumb. Um, so when the PSI is over 0 0.1, you need to start digging around because uh, it, it means that there's a, a, an identified discrepancy between the new data set and the trained data set. Um, and uh, it means that you need to dig around. It's, it's un unsure if your uh, model will perform as well on the new data. Um, as you could see, this is a, a very simple, it runs quickly. Uh, it's easily interpretable because at the end, it's just comparing um, uh, histograms. Uh, however, it doesn't look at any interaction between uh, features. Uh, it, it needs uh, many observations. So you need at least hundreds of observation uh, per samples. So the baseline and the new data uh, because it's a statistical test uh, and it's not optimal for sparse uh, and binary data. But, but still it's like a great way to just at least start looking around and uh, just validating uh, elements uh, when you have new data. Another techniques that I really enjoy is, uh, it's called local outlier factor. So this is, uh, is uh, essentially uh, anomaly de detection. So here what we see is, uh, we see uh, a distribution, so a data, a data structure. And then the goal will be to run it first on your baseline data and then trying to compare the uh, the new data so you it's it's like in you know when you're in uh, elementary school and you have this uh, the the acetate you, you you put one and then you put another one uh, on top of it and you just look if the 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 uh, the point every uh, observation uh, are uh, falling over other observation or other groups of observation so here, for instance, the bigger the uh, circle, the more likely it is that those are anomalies. Uh, that's uh, great because you can, uh, you can identify uh, anomalies on new data, but you can also identify some, um, some uh, biases in your trained uh, data set. Uh, so it would mean one uh, data point that uh, even in trained, uh, some data points that are uh, alone and uh, it will make it more difficult for the model to predict those because they, they didn't have enough, uh, enough uh, observation, similar observation to uh, take a, the, a good decision. So the way it works, it will look at the distance. So it's, it's, a, um, it's like a KNN, but for, uh, for anomaly detection. So the way it works, it will, um, if you say uh, n equal, equals three, so you look at the three nearest neighbors, it will look at the average distance from every of the neighbors. And then you will look at the distance of uh, the neighbors, three neighbors. And then it's just a ratio. So essentially, is this point, so point A, further from its neighbors than its neighbors. And this way you're able to calculate some values. So essentially, if we take the, uh, the, the, the big uh, circle at the top left, uh, we could say, and 
it's a little bit more complex, but you could say that this point is about eight times further from, uh, from the other points than is neighbors. So this is how we can, uh, we can uh, identify that this is an anomaly. Um, when we look at the, the, the neighbors it takes, three neighbors, it's uh, not really forgiving because uh, you usually want to have a little bit more neighbors. A study was made and it, it was uh, said that um, at about 10 neighbors, it's like it's pretty much a sweet spot. Uh, when you're, you're using 10 neighbors to be able to uh, tell if it's a, a true anomaly or not. So you can see here the, uh, the outlier factor is dropping. So it means that it's a little bit more stable because the goal is not to say every data points is an anomaly. The goal is re to, to be able to target the real anomalies there. So this is super because it allows you to identify um, relationship between uh, between uh, variables um, and also what something that's great is it uh, you can use it for one for one observation only this is great because for one observation it means that you could run so you train using the test the the the, the train data set and then after that you could uh, use it for every new data that need to be predicted you could just look, oh, is this new point similar to what I add in my, uh, in my, uh, in my train data set? And then you could say, you know what, it's too, uh, it's too far. Uh, it's an anomaly, so I'll, I will not trigger a, a, a prediction. So this is, uh, this is uh, great. Um, why is this important for initial validation? Uh, you will be able to measure the amount of uh, biases, the data bias. Uh, and when you identify high data bias, then it will it, it, it gives you a little bit of information that your data is probably not uh, clean enough or you could um, you, or you have uh, some uh, rare classes or rare observation that you might want to beef up a little bit. And uh, in monitoring mode, this, uh, these type of uh, stability analysis are great because uh, it will identify some, uh, some changes over time. So we talk data drift when it's about the features uh, or when it's about the, um, the, 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 the labels, then we will talk about concept drift. So when trends start changing along, uh, it's probably time to rethink the, to retrain and potentially change the way the model acts uh, because it might not uh, answer the right, uh, the, the right needs anymore. We we'll talk about uh, now uh, model robustness. So uh, we'll just go back a little bit and talk about, uh, about overfitting for, for, for a bit. Um, so when we talk about overfitting, uh, often we'll think about performance uh, train versus test. Um, and yes, this is great because uh, there's, uh, there's a, so, so when there's a big discrepancy between train and test, uh, train validation and test, uh, it might give you the idea that, uh, that uh, it overfits. However, uh, when it's broken, it's broken. And uh, I've seen uh, very often uh, times where uh, you have duplicates in your data set or you have very similar uh, da uh, data points. Uh, and it gives you a false, uh, a false idea that it's not overfitting. So one of the best techniques I've seen so far is the one that I'm going to present. And it's based on the idea of uh, Overfitting. So, when so if you look at the decision the the decision boundary, so it, it would be the uh, dotted line. You see that the decision boundary when it overfit, it it starts to surround uh, data data points, and this is how it's able to uh, to 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 put aside some uh, some observation and say you know what this. Even though it, it's, it doesn't fit within like a optimal boundary, I'll change it into the right class. 
So classic overfill. And uh, a great way to avoid that is to try to, to see what's happening if I'm creating noise around those, uh, those points that are near the uh, decision boundaries. And this is why we decided uh, to start using adversarial examples. Adversarial examples is a great uh, way to, to, to test what's the, what's the limit and what's the impact when you start moving around those, uh, those data points that are near the, uh, the, the decision boundaries. So uh, uh, adversarial examples, uh, uh, many people know what uh, adversarial examples uh, nowadays. We talk uh, about it, but mostly for uh, hacking and uh, for uh, for security purpose. Here, I'm talking about it from a robustness purpose. So, the goal here is to try to to say, you know what? What happen if I target the 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 data points that are the most vulner vulnerable? and I'm adding just a little bit of noise, what is the impact on my performance? Uh, there are plenty of great, uh, great packages already existing or great methods already existing that you can use. Something like fast gradient, uh, sign methods, FGSM are good, good methods that you can, you can use. And the goal will be to See, so if you create noise, so the blue, uh, the, the blue X uh, are pushed, uh, will, it, will it impact greatly my performance or not? So here you can see at the right, we, if we compare two, uh, two, uh, two models, you can see that one model is more performant than model one, but uh, is a little bit less robust. So as soon as you start putting, creating a little bit of noise, uh, you, you, you'll start seeing performance drop uh, more abruptly than a model two that is a little bit less performant or less precise, but much more robust. Um, this here, uh, because the, uh, a problem that we, we were confronted uh, we were confronted to a problem there is that you have an hyperparameter that asks you to select the amount of noise that you want to create. And this is unclear uh, what's the amount of noise you, you need to put. Uh, the way we decided to skip that problem was by using the, the data stability method that we looked at. And so we just end up creating a lot of uh, uh, noise at different levels. So sometimes it's 1% of noise, other times it's 20% uh, of noise. And uh, I make sure that this noise fit uh, within my data structure using uh, uh, the LOF technique that we just talked about. And this way uh, I make sure that I'm not just creating random data points that have no, uh, no purpose of being even looked at because they should look like the, the the real data points and then i'm measuring the performance and when you measure the performance uh all the data that uh, gave a um, bad performance was great with uh using adversarial examples is that you could even take those data points that were uh that that were impacting ne negatively the model and then you could retrain on those data points to make your model even more robust. So you just create a loop of validation, uh, then you validate and you retrain, and then you revalidate that, uh, that your model uh, is, uh, is covering those, those aspects. For initial validation, like I said uh, before, it uh, detects overfit. It, it also is very, very performant to, um, to identify uh, uh, leakage. So leakage when uh, you, you're using data from the future that should not be there. Uh, so usually when you identify leakage, 
uh, when there's leakage in your data set, uh, additional importance would be on this variable. And uh, what it means is uh, as soon as you, you'll put a little bit of noise in this, uh, this variable, uh, all hell break loose. It's going to destroy the performance of your model. Um, so this is how you can uh, also see a leakage there. Um, and uh, suffice to say this, so the initial goal was only to look at extreme scenarios, but we were pleased to see that it uh, it covers so much more ground, but but here it would cover uh, extreme scenarios that might happen but have not happened yet. Uh, in production, it's not something that you will use in day to day, but you can use to train your model to cover those in day to day, and uh, you can reuse uh, 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 those uh, this technique uh, every time you retrain because uh, you don't just want to uh, uh, have a, a good initial, uh, um, robust initial model. And as soon as you retrain, it starts being just on the, uh, the, the like accuracy or loss. You also want to make sure that every iteration of your model stay uh, robust. Otherwise, uh, what's, the, what, what's the point? Uh, the last, the last uh, uh, dimension that we look is a prediction certainty. So here is uh, an example of two uh, of uh, two models, one uh, one uh, healthy model, and another one that is degrading. So uh, we've been able to identify at MovieEye that there's a large uh, that there's an important correlation between. Um, between uh, model degradation and uh, and the uncertainty. So in other words, conf uh, inter uh, confidence interval. So here what you see, you see with, uh, with time, the, uh, the confidence interval is increasing when it degrades. So the performance will degrade and the confidence interval will increase. Um, when you're in on the spot, because you don't just want to wait until you get the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the ground truth to tell if your model was good at the time. You want to be able on the spot to identify when your model is triggering a bad prediction. And uh, because you don't want to look at the performance at decreasing, at least you know that if you're looking at the, uh, an increase in uh, confidence interval, you can have a sign that your prediction you're making is probably not super accurate. Um, and uh, this is uh, what uh, we, we were using. Uh, it's, it's another tool that we're using. But I know when we talk about confidence interval, often we feel like uh, we're, uh, like it has been 10 years and we're talking about uh, linear regression. Uh, here, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a way to do it using deep learning. And this is uh, so easy, um, but, uh, but this is something that uh, we don't talk very much. And so let me explain. Um, when you train a deep learning model, you'll use uh, often, uh, uh, you'll use a dropout. And then when your model is, uh, ro is uh, robust enough, is, uh, is optimal enough, you then say, you know what, my model is great. And then you just, okay, my job is done. And then you stop using a dropout anymore. Um, but here, what I'm suggesting, and you can see the link underneath, uh, is you can, every time you predict, you can create a function that will remove some uh, some neurons in uh, randomly, and then you could try to do a prediction with 100% of the neurons, so like a normal prediction. But then you could create a bunch of uh, of, of triggers. So if you remove 10% of the neurons, 20%, 50% of the what's the prediction that is uh, triggered? 
So here you can see a little bit the, uh, the, the, the different dropouts. So uh, here it's from 20% of the dropout uh, that are uh, of the neurons that are dropped to 60% of the neurons that are dropped. And then uh, you can characterize, you can see the span of your prediction. By the way, this is something you, you don't only have to use a confidence interval on, uh, on regression. You can use it uh, as well on classification. So here is an example. If you use your full uh, test set, what you could see is you could see your, uh, your prediction, your normal prediction. Uh, and then you could look with, uh, with dropout, your, uh, the span, and it really clarify, uh, the, uh, it, it really clarify the amount of, uh, the, 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 uh, amount of uncertainty that, uh, you have when you start doing your, uh, your predictions in real time. Um, and also this is something you can use in real time to pre prevent, uh, Prediction that are just too uh, too large uh, to be tr to 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 be proposed to uh, to your your end users. So here is an example in real time. So you could measure the average confidence interval by week, for instance, and then when it increases too much, then you could retrain your model. So like I said before, um, you can. For initial validation, you can measure the comfort of your end users, and then during monitoring, you can uh, you can just monitor and make sure that uncertainty is not uh, increasing too much. So, in conclusion, uh, and I'm sorry, I know I talked about so many uh, things, but uh, in conclusion, I hope that I'm, I was able to to convey the message that um, validation is is super important and it's not only about uh, looking at the precision, looking at accuracy or loss. Um, you, sh you need to look underneath. Is it stable? Is it, uh, is it robust? Is it uh, certain? And then uh, also if I had time, I would have talked about uh, fairness techniques uh, that in my opinion is really important as well. And the techniques that I just talked to you about uh, are uh, great techniques that are still uh, underdog or they're, they're not uh, they're, they're not uh, the, the validation side of uh, of uh, deep learning is not super popular these days uh, but it will become very soon uh, and uh, I hope that you'll start using those uh, as uh, as uh, the, the same type of methods and then we that we could start having a discussion so th thank you very much everybody uh, I'll go in the chat and I'll see if I have any questions. Okay, so uh, yeah, there was a, qu a question about accuracy versus uh, versus certainty. Um, the the problem with uh, accuracy, for instance, in a uh, in a uh, classification type, it's because the accuracy is uh, is when you look at the uh, at the class by itself. So if if my prediction is over 50%, uh, it's a one under under 50%, it's a zero, for instance. Um, the problem you have is that you're pretty blind if your prediction, if, if your probability is at uh, 52%, yes, you, fall, you felt into a category that might be good uh, when you train it, but you're, you're very uncertain that you reach the right conclusion you're at 2% from flipping the other side. So this is the difference between having a good accuracy versus having a certain, uh, a certain prediction. Um, when we talk about, uh, there, there was a good question about, uh, okay, I think it's an, an answer, but uh, imbalance, uh, oh, by the way, when we have imbalance uh, data set, uh, here what I'm suggesting for when you look at when you, you look at uh, population stability and the uh, uh, data stability methods, uh, when it's highly imbalanced, I would split it in two. Um, if you only have 1% that are uh, 
I don't know, trainers or cancer patient, um, you, you, you probably need to look, uh, to look at stability of this population uh, separately and then do it on the, on the, 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 the non-cancer uh, patient. Um, the population stability index, uh, uh, this, this one, I, uh, this, uh, the, the population stability index, I'll always use it. It's always a good first step uh, because your population stability index, it, it's so easy to run uh, and it gives a good, a good idea. Uh, then after that, you can go into uh, the next, uh, and often when you don't see uh, big discrepancies, that's when you want to trigger other type of, of methods. But the other type of methods, it's probably more into a monitoring purpose um, when you want to validate every new prediction if it's an anomaly or not. Uh, yes, LOF is a technique that uh, allows you to uh, tell if if the prediction that you're, if the data that you're about to use to make a prediction should be used. Uh, so yes, uh, here I can give a, a clear example with uh, COVID-19, um, some, uh, some behavioral data has changed. And uh, if your model uh, has not used this, uh, this data, which probably has not in the first phase of COVID, uh you could see discrepancies there uh, that you didn't have time to capture so what it would do it would just you know identify those uh, and then just tell you you know what you have a problem so fix your your things because otherwise uh we we like the prediction will just not be good because you 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 should not extrapolate uh when uh it's so different okay um the maybe the, the last question uh, it's about uh, data variability. Um, it data, uh, data variability is a good way to uh, it's a good way to avoid uh, having a, uh, a, a a sensitive model. The more uh, variable your data is, the better it gets. Um, there's no magic trick. I mean, um, the best is, but but there are some tricks. Um, the best is to be able to capture as much data as possible. But let's say you have a good, a good data set, uh, and then you train your model. If you want to be a little bit more uh, robust, you might you might want to create uh, you you might want to augment data uh, using techniques like uh, SMOT. Uh, so creating synthetic uh, synthetic observation, um, or you can use the um, the uh, uh, the, the um, um, sorry about that I have a blank um, the adversarial example that I talked about. So the adversarial examples will create some some data points that are very risky. Um, so you could use uh, the adversarial examples to uh, beef up your uh, your your uh, your data your da uh, data set, and uh, those. If you use those techniques, by the way, do not please do not use uh, the uh, those in your testing and validation uh, da uh, da data set because uh, those don't represent the reality. But those are great. Uh, we call it regularization techniques. So it helps your model being a little bit more uh, generalizable, but they don't reflect the reality. Um, standardization, uh, yeah, you need to, it, it depends, so either standardize or normalize. Uh, normalization is uh, when you uh, reduce the, 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 the span. Uh, so like a min-max will normalize your, your data. Uh, and when you standardize, it's when you standardize on the, the distribution. It really depends on your use case, but you should, uh, you should usually do, do this, especially when you're, you're using uh, advanced techniques. But any, techni any te technique might be better when you normalize or standardize your uh, data. Um, for stability, uh, index and LOF, 
you should uh, you should uh, standard uh, normalize uh, or standardize your data for sure. Um, text data distribution uh, drift uh, LOF is is great to to measure that because you will have a you will have a data distribution and every word or every uh, letter will be a, a token so a one zero. Uh, the problem you you should not use uh, data stability index because it's too sparse. Uh, you'll have much uh, you you'll have many zeros and few ones. So, uh, but, but using uh, using uh, uh, like LOF, the only problem you'll have with LOF is that you you have uh, it, it it's multi-dimensional. So you might want to use a uh, a uh, you want you, you might want to use a uh, data uh, a sorry, a PCA or a uh, variability reduction uh, technique uh, to be able to uh, reduce the number of uh, dimensions, but, but it should work fine, and you'll be able to uh, to to run LOF on uh, on text data. So whenever you see where, uh, weird text that uh, should not correspond uh, one to another, like uh, words that don't fit together. Uh, you can sound an, uh, ring an alarm. Uh, any other questions before uh, we end this uh, this uh, presentation? That takes a very uh, longer than uh, than expected, but this is great. So if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free. Otherwise, uh, uh, you can contact me at any time. Um, my my email address is uh, lv.latmove.ai. Um, the document uh, documentation that can list summarize. Um, I don't yet have this documentation, but on the Move AI blogs, I will. Uh, I, I, I'm about to complete an article that will uh, be released soon. So what I'll do, I'll release it so you can follow uh, Move AI LinkedIn. A page or a Twitter uh, page, uh, or you can follow me directly. Uh, my name is Olivier Blair. I think you can uh, find me uh, quite easily uh, on social medias. Uh, and I'll communicate uh, about those techniques. And also, I'll communicate about some uh, validation uh, best practices that uh, that are coming in the ISO uh, norms. So great, so on that, uh, thank you very much for your time and I wish you a good uh, end of, uh, of uh, uh, summit. And thanks uh, David and uh, the, the, the team to invite me and I hope I'll be able to be uh, invited for the next, uh, the, the next events. Have a great one, bye-bye.